The countries of the European Union account for one fifth of the world economy. That is more than the United States and as much as China and India combined. The US and the EU have the strongest trade and economic relationship in the world. It accounts for more than $820 billion of annual trade in goods and services, an investment stock of $2.5 trillion and 50 million jobs. These are impressive numbers. This economic interdependence is a major opportunity. There is much more we can do together. Opening up markets, creating jobs and growth in the green economy, in services, bringing down regulatory barriers for trade and investment. There is real momentum today to work on a transatlantic trade agreement, even if we are not there yet. Of course, economic interdependence sometimes also entails risks. For instance, people in the United States do not want Greece to become the next Lehman Brothers. Well, neither do we. And the Europeans could reply, they did not like the first Lehman either. We both have a responsibility for issues that affect the others as well. We should not try to shift the responsibility for each other's economic woes to the other side. A transatlantic blame game will not help anybody. Each side should work to bring its own house in order. On the European side, we are working on it. We are fully aware of our responsibilities, not only for our own economic woes, our own jobs, but for the world economy. The interdependence between transatlantic financial sectors is so strong that, as the New York State Controller pointed out last year, the European debt crisis cost 10,000 jobs in Wall Street. So we have an interest on both sides to think in terms of co-responsibility and common opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, why do I talk about the economy at the margin of a NATO summit. Not only because, for instance, the situation in Greece is on everybody's minds these days, and not only because budgetary constraints have an impact on defense budgets, which is the case. No, a stable economic environment is itself a security issue, and very much perceived so by European public opinion. Another reason why we have to bring this economic crisis to rest. This brings me to security issues in the most traditional sense. The United States and the European Union are working closely together on many of today's most burning foreign policy issues, like Iran and the Middle East peace process. We also work together on crisis management around the world, sending soldiers and police trainers to Afghanistan and Kosovo to gather fighting pirates off the coast of Somalia. For missions like those, Europeans are still America's most re reliable allies. Not so long ago, there were 30,000 European soldiers in Afghanistan. That was no small feat, especially taking into account the reservations of European public opinion. We will also remain engaged beyond 2014 in supporting Afghan security and development. And for all the talk of new global partners, I do not see any time soon comparable numbers of troops from these new global partners patrolling in Kandahar, Kabul, or Kunduz. A word on the Libya experience. A lot has been said since a year on its lessons for transatlantic cooperation and division of responsibility. I indeed think it was a defining moment and a positive one. Firstly, Europeans were in the lead in a crisis in our own neighborhood, right across the Mediterranean, and with Americans in the so-called backseat. This was new. But the second lesson, as has been noted, was that American assistance was needed 
if not to win the war, at least to win the battles with overwhelming force. In that respect, it functioned for Europeans as a wake-up call. At today's summit, I will give an outline to the other leaders of how the European Union can contribute to global security in cooperation with NATO. Let me mention three elements. First, the European Union is well-placed to address today's complex security challenges. We have a comprehensive approach. It ranges from trade and development to conflict, conflict prevention and crisis management. The EU is the world's largest development donor, providing more than half of total aid flows, helping millions of households worldwide to get access to drinking water, millions of children to get primary education and so on. We also help developing countries with money to fight climate change, another security threat where so-called soft power can deliver hard results. Secondly, the current financial situation has made European concertation of cooperation in the area of development of military capabilities more urgent. Later today, I will be able to announce concrete progress on pooling and sharing European military capabilities. And one example is air-to-air -air refueling which was a critical capability shortfall during the Libya operation. We are drawing the lessons. However, more needs to be done, and we are only at the start of a process. And thirdly, the European Union remains committed to further strengthening its strategic partnership with NATO. More frequent political dialogue, enhanced cooperation in crisis management and further synergies in development of military capabilities are areas where I see potential for most progress. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude already, I should like to nuance this idea of Europe becoming less relevant in yet another way. During the Cold War, Europe was the center of world's attention. However, we were not so much a player, but rather a prize, the main stake in the global conflict. We were the problem. However, we solved this problem ourselves. The people of Eastern Europe brought down the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, attracted by the freedom and prosperity of the West. Today, we are not a problem anymore but we are still very much there and as this other most mostly stable, free and prosperous continent. I personally still believe in the concept of the West, even after the end of the Cold War, not because we have a common enemy, but because we have common values. Europe and the United States have more in common than either of us with Africa, Latin America, or China. It is so obvious that we tend to forget it. When push comes to shove, this will be a bond upon which we can build. And in my conviction, a flourishing NATO is indispensable to it. Thank you. President, thank you very much for those remarks. I think you very rightly pointed to the strong economic relationship, the partnership between the US and the EU, which is basically the strongest part of the global economy at this point in history. Um, and you also mentioned how that can lead to transmissions of uh, instability at times. Um, what do you expect over the next few months in Europe? You're facing a key election in June and some very quick decisions afterwards. Um, and I ask not only because of the economics, but you've laid out a very ambitious program and a portrait of Europe as a player on the world stage. And many of us uh, who are friends of Europe are very concerned about the bandwidth issue, if I can put it that way. 
uh, it's very difficult to manage an economic crisis uh, that of the type that you had, and June will be a key month. So can you look forward and tell us a little bit about that and, and beyond where you think mm -hmm. it will go? June will be a key month, uh, but not for the reasons you mentioned, uh, because there is much more convergence already now, even with the new French president, on the growth and job agenda than most people think. Uh, I had personally had a meeting with President Hollande uh, three days after his election. He was his first foreign visitor. There was a context uh, in Berlin uh, between the German Chancellor and the French President, uh, and it went well. Uh, here also there was a lot of convergence uh, in, in, in positions, on especially on fiscal consolidation, on growth, and on jobs. But going a little bit further, uh, normally, I would say without the Greek crisis, which is a political crisis, mm. I will explain it. Without the Greek crisis, we would have, we will have at the end of this year, positive economic growth uh, on average over the Eurozone and certainly in Western Europe. There is no recession in Germany, no recession in France, no recession in Austria, no recession in Belgium even. So there is a northern part which is doing rather well, rather well, a southern part who are suffering from the impact, of course, of the inevitable fiscal consolidation. But overall, we will have positive economic growth by the end of this year and the beginning of next year. But we have to deal with the Greek crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, we found solutions for the Greek debt um, uh, in January and February, but we had the elections in, in Greece. And so this is a political issue. Mm -hmm. And the main parties who supported the memorandum uh, couldn't get a majority. There, there was a lack of two seats, only two seats. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with the, the, Greek, uh, the Greek elections, as you, if you speak about June, June that, uh, not, not the French election, but the Greek election. Uh, the Greek election was to, to deal with it. But we, are s we, we said yesterday uh, that Greek belongs to Europe. Greek, Greece is a member of the Eurozone and it has to stay uh, in the Eurozone. But of course they have to respect the commitment that not the Greek government made, mm -hmm. but the Greek state made. Uh, and so I'm uh, hopeful that the Greek leadership uh, will understand this very clear message and that reason uh, ultimately will prevail. Uh, and and, and that's, that's the, the big challenge for the upcoming, the upcoming months. By the end of June, uh, we will have a European Council with the 27 heads of state of government uh, uh, making decisions on the growth and the job agenda. And we prepared this meeting this week, on Wednesday, the 23rd, uh, of, uh, of May. But overall, uh, and I put for one moment the Greek crisis between brackets, overall the situation in Europe, in the Eurozone as a whole, as far as Greek growth and jobs are concerned, are, is not that, that dramatic as I often read in, in, in the international press. I put this very mildly. Thank you. Yeah. Let me bring in some of our uh, delegates here, and if you could move, um, well, you're all the way, I guess you should go to the outside there, there's a microphone, and be sure to introduce yourself. And if, I saw someone else over here, if you could be ready at this microphone after this. Yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. President. Timothy Stafford from the United Kingdom. You spoke about the Greek crisis, but of course there's problems in Spain, problems in Italy, problems in Ireland and problems in Portugal. How do you respond to those who say that this is a fundamental crisis of the Eurozone between the states in the northern part that do have good economic growth, as you mentioned, and the states in the southern part that have suffered very badly as a result of the Euro? Do you not think that it's the fundamental crisis rather than the Greek crisis which you keep talking about? The Greek crisis is of the Greece is a totally different case of Portugal, Spain, and Italy, and so on, for many, many reasons. Uh, also, for, for, 
for reasons uh, very easy linked to, the, for instance, the, the level of the public debt. Huh? Uh, it was 160 percent, but after what we call the PSI, the private sector involvement, uh, it will go back to 120 percent, which is still a high level, but a level that is manageable. By the way, it is not as far as that level of that of the United States. Uh, and I come from a country, Belgium, which has, when I became Minister of the Budget, we had a level of public debt of 135 percent, 135 percent. We are still, I am I'm still here. Huh? <laughs> still here. So we, 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 could, we could manage this. Uh, it was difficult, but we did, we did the job. It is not because there are problems that the Eurozone is on the brink of collapse. You will always have problems, certainly in the monetary union. And there will always be a country with a banking problem, with a competitiveness problem, with a problem of, of, of deficit. But the, that's not the problem. The problem is can those countries overcome their difficulties? And for instance, Italy. Italy just received a report by the IMF. It's a very positive report. Uh, in the summer of last year, it was in a dramatic situation. Dramatic situation. We are one year later, and we have a positive report from the IMF. Even Portugal, it could be uh, that there are some rumors about asking for a new program and so on, but overall, overall, the assessment of the ECB, <coughs> of the European Commission, of the IMF, on the progress made in Portugal is positive. So those reforms, that, that's, that do, uh, takes time. Don't forget this. Uh, we are in a process of uh, deepening and strengthening our monetary union. The first 10 years of the, of the, uh, of the history of the euro uh, was a, a period in which the problems were not tackled at all. There was positive economic growth. It was not needed uh, to correct uh, fiscal imbalances, to correct uh, deficits on the current account. Even the financial markets were aware of anything. They gave Greece a triple A rating. Eh? And then the, the spread uh, between the Bund and the, the Greek bond was very, very narrow. Eh? Now they, they saw nothing, and now we, we are in a, in a phase that each problem uh, can have a, a, disproportion, a disproportionate uh, attention. So we can overcome this problem. But this is a, not a sprint, this is a marathon. Uh, so strengthening your monetary union takes many years, but we, so we can overcome this problem. The problem with Greece is a unique and exceptional situation, economically speaking. And uh, politically speaking, after the election, uh, it is, of course, a very difficult situation. That's why we made this appeal to the Greek political leaders to stick to their commitment, because without reforms, there is no future uh, for, for, uh, for their people. Reforms are needed. Europe or not Europe, if you have a deficit of 15% at some moment and a public debt level of 160%, this is simply not sustainable if they are in the Eurozone or not in the Eurozone. They had to tackle those problems much earlier than today, much earlier than today. So this is a unique and exceptional case and I'm quite confident that the end <coughs> reason, as I said, will prevail, and then we will go on. But uh, it will be a, 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 a difficult period. I have a mandate until the 1st of December 2014. Uh, these problems keep me busy uh, until the end of my mandate. Okay. Excellent, and we have a shrinking amount of time and more questioners, so short questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gergely Varga, young Atlanticist from uh, Hungary. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, for addressing us uh, here in Chicago in this wonderful city. Um, although a couple of weeks ago it was still in question uh, due to uh, one of the NATO members' concerns whether the European Union could actually participate in the conference itself. Uh, itself. What do you see NATO-EU relations today and uh, how do you see the chances for overcoming the obstacles uh, in this relation? Thank you. There was no problem attending the North Atlantic Council and ISAF meetings. We were in Lisbon two years ago. We are here today as a European institution. 
So uh, there were a lot of rumors, uh, but there was no real, no, no real problem. Uh, for as far as the EU-NATO relations are concerned, there is, of course, the the question of Cyprus and the relations with Turkey, which uh, is a, a obstacle to, in some way, to have deeper relations than today. So we are managing all this in a very, in a very pragmatic way, uh, in a step-by-step -step approach, uh, working together, cooperating on specific projects. I mentioned in my speech uh, a lot of crisis management uh, operations but we, we in which we work closely together. But now we are embarked in, in, in a new process of uh, sharing, uh, pooling and sharing. Uh, and at the same time, there is a, a, a NATO strategic concept on, on defense, which has the same objectives as we have. And we are working very closely together now on this project. We are, have also more intense contact uh, between the Secretary General of the NATO and, for instance, our Foreign Affairs Council, uh, chaired by the High Representative for Foreign Policy. So we are, as much as we can, given the institutional framework uh, and given the fact that there is that pending conflict between Turkey and, and Cyprus, we are working as much as we can on a pragmatic basis, on a step-by-step -step basis. And now, uh, with this initiative on pooling and sharing, I think uh, we are really, really uh, working uh, very closely together, but again, with the constraints I mentioned. And we only have time for one final question, I think, over here. Uh, hello, my name is Kristina Mikulova. I'm a young philanthropist from Slovakia. Mr. President, thank you for finding the time to speak to us. I want to react to something that you said in your speech. Soft power can deliver hard results. Well, I would like to ask for concrete examples of how that can be done. Uh, the concept of smart defense uh, championed by NATO was in part responding to uh, the eroding credibility of the EU as a hard power. Hard power is an element of soft power, if not its very basis. Then soft power itself, uh, you know, the days when the EU uh, had almost this magnetic attraction for countries on its orbit as a haven of stability, prosperity, uh, well, the euro crisis has brought that into question. So please, can you explain to me how do we have soft power delivering hard results when all of its elements seem to be in question? Mm -hmm. I'm not opening a ideological debate or a theological debate about the definition of soft and hard. You can do it, I'm not a student anymore. <laughs> uh, so that's not, not really my business. But I'll give you a, a very, very clear example of soft power. We had the Cold War and the Iron Threat and the Berlin Wall. This was the most divisive issue, not in Europe, but in world politics, mm -hmm. for decades, for decades. Of course, uh, we were very grateful of, uh, of the presence of NATO troops uh, in Europe, or and especially American troops, all the time. So they and 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 and, and, and they just played a very big role as a deterrent, uh, stabilizing the situation. But at the end, it was the attractiveness of Western European countries that brought people in Central and Eastern Europe to revolution. A revolution without bloodshed, and he brought the, they brought down the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain. And without a shot, without a, anybody killed or hurt. So this is a good example of, you can call it a combination of hard power due to the NATO presence, but also of soft power. Uh, our attractiveness, we are sexy, you forget it, huh? you forgot <laughs> it. Uh, this, the, the attractiveness of Western European societies for those people, for those people uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. And that created, yeah, some kind of revolution. That's why Europe is not a problem anymore, as I said in my speech. We are not relevant anymore because we are not a problem anymore. Uh, and, and, and that's a, a paradoxical situation, but this really. So this is, in my view, a good example, a good example of soft power getting hard results. But in a global analysis, uh, you can say it was a combination of hard and of soft power. If you meant this, I would agree with you.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. It's been a pleasure to have you here at the Young Atlanticist Summit. We could clearly have gone on for much longer, and hopefully next time we will have that option. Uh, but I think the number of issues on the table just showed the complexity, both of the European Union and of the Transatlantic Partnership. So thank you very much. Thank you.